years plus. So um, we are still trying to figure out exactly how we're going to end the day. We're going to try to finish more or less on time, which means contracting the final panel. And uh, it, we'll play it by ear a bit exactly how we do that. We want to give a chance for, for questions. And But um, Kate and Rebecca, if you could come up. Uh, Kate Hudson is an attorney at Riverkeeper, and she spent many years as the, uh, in the regional attorney's office in this part of New York State uh, for, for DEC. And uh, she's working on water issues in the region. Uh, she has worked closely with people in Kingston uh, and, and Woodstock about this water bottling story that you're going to hear a bit about, and some of you heard Annabelle Finois speak earlier. And uh, Rebecca Martin is a, a citizen advocate, I will say, also a musician and uh, a resident of Kingston. And uh, she got very involved in this, this uh, process they're going to talk about. So take it away. Thank you very much, and if all of you are feeling anything like I am right now, um, we've had a tremendous amount of information thrown at us by some wonderful presentations. You're probably feeling a little overwhelmed. <laughs> um, uh, we will try to be pithy and, uh, and, uh, and interesting. Um, so why are two of us sitting up here? The reason, very basically, is because the only way in which we were able to fight and defeat a proposal to build a water bottling plant in Ulster County was because we did it as a coalition of some fairly unorthodox, non-traditional partners. And so we are going to do this as a team, um, as a tag team. and. Um, just very briefly, uh, some of you may have heard the earlier presentation about this, but in case you didn't, uh, the, a, a national uh, water bottling company, Niagara, uh, came to uh, this area and proposed to build a water bottling plant in the town of Ulster on the IBM campus. Um, and use water uh, that they proposed to purchase from the city of Kingston. Uh, and that water, the city of Kingston's water, comes from the town of Woodstock. So we are talking about at least three different watersheds that were impacted or potentially impacted by this proposal. Uh, and obviously a lot of municipal governments. Um, we are gonna try and cover uh, for basic things, why this was such a surprise for the communities and the organizations impacted, uh, how a coalition grew and how the strategies we used to, to try and uh, push back against this project were uh, shaped by the partners that became involved. Um, the challenge of fighting a regional battle, particularly when the approach of government uh, was to call it a local issue. Um, and finally, where do we go from here? So just a moment to introduce ourselves. I'm not sure whether Simon identified the fact that I now work for Riverkeeper. Um, and I was thinking about this. Riverkeeper is... Uh, our mission is to uh, be uh, New York's clean water advocate. We're focused on principally the Hudson River and protecting the uh, New York City drinking watershed. But it occurred to me that we are in fact a watershed group. I don't think of us as that, um, as a traditional watershed group, but we are in fact a watershed group um, protecting both the New York City drinking watershed and the Hudson River watershed. So my name is Rebecca Martin, and um, I'm really honored to be here today and to be with Kate Hudson, who's been a hero of mine for a long time, and to have a chance to work with her as we did in the city of Kingston. I'm one of the founders um, of, a, of an organization. It's not a not-for-profit. It's a citizen-run volunteer group. It's about a decade um, old, and uh, we have organized to encourage citizen participation and engagement in the city of Kingston, and it began as an experiment to see how we could um, access our 
council members, there are nine in the city of Kingston, um, with educational meetings every month on relevant topics inside of the city of Kingston, um, inviting experts in to educate the public. The public, in turn, would give their opinions and feelings on how they wanted to be represented at City Hall. And um, we made a lot of progress and, and have worked on up to 100 different issues from small, benign issues all the way to really big projects like Niagara. And I think that our work over the past decade prepared us to become a good partner in this process. So I think that there's two different levels on why we were surprised when a year ago we found out that this proposal uh, was not only in the works but had received a fair amount of uh, movement and uh, initial approval by various uh, town governments and state uh, agencies. Um, I don't know whether you want me, why don't you start with your experience about yes, finding right. out, yeah. Well, we were surprised because we, we found out about Niagara Bottling's proposal um, on the evening that the planning board and the town of Ulster passed it through to the um, town board to be lead agency in something called Seeker, um, which we're all familiar with, um, and that um, the project, a bottling facility in the town of Ulster, would be reliant on 1.75 million gallons per day of water from Kingston's municipal town source that was in the town of Woodstock. And for the most part, um, uh, there are very few elected officials that, that had heard of the proposal who were in each of the municipalities and certainly there weren't any citizens aware that this was taking place. Um, but I think there's another reason why this came as such a surprise to the communities that were potentially impacted and the region. And that is because I don't think any of us, I certainly could, could say this is true for myself, had really even begun to understand the larger issue that was not on our radar screen, which is that water uh, is becoming a commodity uh, to be sold for a profit, driven by scarcity, um, and we always say Northeast, really, scarcity. But um, this was a California company. Uh, because of climate change, pollution of water creates scarcity. You can have a lot of water, but if it's polluted, you can't use it. And privatization, even in the Northeast. And one of the examples of privatization we have just to our south in Rockland County, where 85% of the water is uh, uh, provided by a private utility, uh, private company. And the second piece of this puzzle is that municipal sale of water is being driven by the need to fund repairs to decaying water infrastructure. And this is a whole other area uh, that uh, was completely off my radar screen, but was certainly one of the drivers in the case of Kingston. Um, and so those two were the perfect storm coming together for that was the backdrop for this proposal moving forward. I just want to add that as a citizen, what we also learned was that we didn't have a voice or a role in any of the decisions that were being made on our municipal water supply. The Kingston Water Department, we learned, was an independent uh, department and board that had exclusive decision making uh, of our water source, which is one of the problems for us in, in essentially how our water is, is managed, how it's sold, how it's uh, brought to us, etc. cetera. It's, it's, it's off of our radar because the what well, one of the reasons, and there's so much to address, but <laughs> we can't. Um, but that was a huge thing for us, and it, it created um, a lot of uh, public uh, concern uh, that we didn't have a role in this particular uh, process, or any. 
process. And I think that this is a theme that uh, we see in Rockland County as well. It is the realization on the part of citizens um, for particular reasons that are particular to local areas, but the, the theme is that they do not have a voice in very, very important decisions being made about a critical resource uh, that they all depend on. So, um, so how did we, who were we? Uh, who came together to fight this project and how did it together and how did that impact the strategies that we ended up using and I was invited to a meeting at Rebecca's house and that's how I became involved. So I'm going to let her tell us how this coalition was pulled together. So I just want to start by acknowledging some of the partners that are here tonight in the audience that uh, were critical in our work. Um, the first is one of my intimate partners, Jennifer Schwartz Berkey, who's here tonight and who is now running for uh, District 7 Legislature, uh, which we're all proud of her. We have Mary McNamara tonight, who's here, uh, who I met. Yep. <laughs> a long time ago in her work with Loop, and she was a partner through the Esopus uh, Creek Conservancy. Um, Kevin Smith from the Woodstock Land Conservancy is here tonight with Annabelle, who presented earlier. We couldn't have done this without them. And of course, Kate Hudson from Riverkeeper, who was incredibly generous in helping us to be strategic um, in this work. And I also would like to to acknowledge Ken Panza, who's here tonight from Woodstock, who I look forward to meeting afterwards. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, but you know, our first attempt in terms of partners was to immediately uh, con uh, alert the public about what was happening and to give the public an, a, a chance immediately to speak. Um, and so within a week of finding out, to uh, the, the first opportunity through our common council meeting. It was not an agenda item, but we packed council chambers and spoke during the public comment time on the concerns of Niagara and immediately started messaging to give the public as much information as possible to allow them to speak to the issue in a way that was constructive and positive and helpful, um, to ask really good questions for uh, to help our elected officials to move forward uh, in a way that was useful. It wasn't a blaming opportunity or yelling. It was very civil. Uh, there were three or four hundred citizens and 50 speakers that night within a week um, and just to wrap up um, what happened from that point on is we were struggling with the issue we knew it was regional we were told by many that well we, we'd like to help but this is a Kingston matter but but over time and following all the threads of this proposal, it was like an octopus and every day there was new information and new questions that, that allowed new people into the, into the conversation with us. And so our coalition grew um, to, to the point where we were speaking daily with people like Kate and Kevin and Mary and, and others that helped us to be so effective um, and that to me was the saving grace was the combination of citizens organizing messaging uh, building trust and these new partnerships came together very quickly uh, some of us had worked together but most of us were new and uh, it was very effective um, uh, coalition in that way. So I just want to mention two examples of some of the levers that we were able to identify that we could pull in terms of pushing back against this project. Um, and they were enabled by the particular areas of expertise and knowledge that various partners had. The first was Seeker. And so where we were in the Seeker process when we discovered the project is that um, the town of Ulster was indicating that it was was going to declare itself the lead agency for Seeker. It had circulated a lead agency letter, and we initiated a huge push to try and persuade DEC as the only regional government agency um, 
uh, that could step up and actually reflect the different uh, concerns and impacts associated with this project. We ultimately were unsuccessful, um, but uh, we did put the project on DEC's radar screen in a way that it, it never dropped off, and we had the sense that they were talking and influencing behind the scenes. Um, then we decided that what we needed to do was to create a record that would make it impossible for the town of Ulster to issue a negative declaration and not require the preparation of an environmental impact statement. And so we partnered with the Woodstock Land Conservancy, hired a consultant, Carpenter, and had them prepare a report of potential impacts, um, which we then published and presented to the town of Ulster, and it put them we think, in a position where they could not, in fact, uh, in good faith with the record before them, issue a, a negative declaration. They issued a positive declaration, required the preparation of an environmental impact statement, and that was certainly one of the factors that influenced uh, Niagara stepping away in February of 2015. The other was economic. and. Unfortunately, Jennifer should be sitting up here because the economic levers were not my expertise, but through various um, channels of information, we found out that uh, this project was being considered for Startup New York money and for uh, regional development money, and we started to expose the um, decision-making process that had led those uh, this project to be considered for uh, funds that did not seem appropriate for what the project represented. And as this, you know, sort of octopus went forward, uh, that actually brought in students at SUNY Ulster who formed the, their own group and approached the, um, the Go ahead. The president of SUNY Ulster and put pressure on Ulster to back away from uh, providing for funding for this project. So I, I did want to note that it, you know one of the complicated things that I think faces us all as watershed organizations is trying to fight a regional battle when uh, the agencies um, and governments um, that are, that are making the decisions are taking a very siloed and segmented approach to that. And I think that one of the ways in which we were able to do that was because of the fact that our coalition was regional. And so we were able to speak out in front of the town of Woodstock Town Board, the town of Red Hook Town Board, um, the city of Kingston, the water board, et cetera. Um, I know we're kind of running low on time. I did want to, sit, to just sort of acknowledge the importance of watershed organizations in fighting battles like this. I know that there, there has been some emphasis on how we are not well suited to fight battles like this, but um, the, you know, the uh, watershed organizations help connect communities with their water resources. And I think that's hugely important in terms of what uh, Rebecca was saying about being able to motivate people to come out and speak out against this project on a very short uh, notice basis. They also start regional water conversations that cross local boundaries, and I think those are really important and was uh, evident in the Wappinger story. And, um, and I think watershed organizations, as happened here, can become critical parts of coalitions with non-traditional partners to creatively push back against water privatization projects that put at risk our local and regional water resources. So one of the last questions, and then I'll let Rebecca say something, I'm talking too much, um, is, well, now that this project has been defeated, um, is that it? You know, do we go back to business as usual because we don't have a crisis to motivate us? And I, my response to that is um, not only is this battle not over, and the crisis is going to continue. And that because, that's because this is just the opening salvo in a local, regional, national, and international battle over water access to water, water as a human right, and water democracy. By that, I mean local communities and citizens having some say, having a voice in how their water resources are uh, used. And um, so this is not 
Niagara went away, we don't have a problem anymore. Um, and so I am, uh, I want to defer to Rebecca because um, there are in our more proactive, now that we've initiated this uh, coalition, um, work that is being done to try and address water democracy um, questions in Kingston. Yeah, so we only have a minute left. So what I'd like to say is that um, the coalition that we had that became regional was really useful in that we had to move all over the place for, for this conversation. There was a um, something in Red Hook. There was something in Woodstock, the town of Ulster. And so our group was so diverse, we could say, okay, who's going? All right, who's speaking? We could really, and to be sensitive to the municipalities that we were going into and the residents and giving the, the respect to the residents to speak in their own municipalities and not to, to uh, you know, take over. Um, but one of the things that we dis, de, uh, created was a task force in the midst of the Niagara proposal, very much inspired by Rock, uh, Rockland and the work that you're doing, and you have our full support, by the way, um, uh, but it was a task force and it, we, we got going and then Niagara pulled out. And so the recourse was now what? We're gonna go back into our communities and take what we've learned and take what we saw and look at how our water, our municipal water departments are set up, look at ways to create opportunities for the public to have some protection as we proceed because we have a lot to do with charter reform and everything else under the sun to update where we are today. Um, and so in Kingston, one of the things we were able to do this year was to, to get a referendum on the ballot that's coming up next week where uh, it's a water sales referendum that will include the Common Council and all water sales um, outside of the corporate boundaries of the city of Kingston, which will now give the public a voice and a seat at the table in Seeker in the future, um, which gives us a little bit of time to, to do the work that we have to do now with the water department and the water board. Um, we have uh, other members who decided to run for office. Uh, we have lots of th positive things going on, and if you'd like to know more, you can visit kingstoncitizens.org. There's also a timeline up there of the Niagara proposal with 116 incidents of what occurred in, uh, in the five-month period that we worked together, and we're still recovering. Our heads were spinning. Um, and uh, thank you very much. And I did want to actually identify one action that not only we are taking as an organization, but all of you can take, and it's a critical one, and that is advocating, lobbying the governor and the New York State Legislature for increased water infrastructure funding in this year's upcoming budget. And we are at a critical point right now. The executive budget is being developed, and we got the indication up in Albany yesterday that they're just going to sit on the 75 million uh, for the next budget year, which is nowhere near what the need is. And so a, a coalition of groups that includes us and Zenith Hudson and a number of other groups are asking for 800 million, and we would appreciate your support um, and communication to your legislators, uh, your state legislators, uh, the governor's office to bring that message home. Thank you. Quickly, uh, just a reminder, the um, conference evaluation forms should be on your tables. If you don't find one, I have some up front. Please leave them on the table or, or on the desk out front, um, as well as your name badge. 